Did the Khmer Rouge really kill everyone with glasses? This question was by Reddit user That's Right J, who asked, I was listening to Dan Carlin's Hardcore History, and at the beginning of the latest episode, he said something about the Khmer Rouge killing everyone with glasses in Cambodia. I'm vaguely aware of the events that took place there, but unsure if this glasses cliché was actually what happened. Could someone explain maybe where this came from, or if it's true? Thanks. Great question. It's a very common idea that is associated with the Khmer Rouge Revolution, and sometimes questioning these well-worn statements about history can reveal some pretty interesting information. But is it true? Was wearing glasses considered a death sentence in revolutionary Cambodia? Well, yes and no. This answer will explain why it might be a useful saying, even if it might not literally be true. What follows is a kind of reformulation of the answer I originally gave to the question on the Ask Historian subreddit about a year ago. I'm also going to assume a certain level of familiarity with the subject here. So if you'd like to brush up on the basics, I would suggest watching the Essentials of Cambodian History that introduces this series. Let's start with where this idea and its association with the Khmer Rouge may have come from. In Elizabeth Becker's book, When the War Was Over, she directly addresses this question, and I quote, Refugees said Cambodians wearing eyeglasses were killed because the Khmer Rouge thought only intellectuals wore eyeglasses. She then states that, These were exaggerations, but they were exaggerations such as are fables, based on a truth too awful to explain. The eyeglasses fable reflected how the Khmer Rouge had targeted intellectuals as dangerous and killed thousands for simply having an education. End quote. Becker here is suggesting that there's truth in the saying, but its common usage could be interpreted as a kind of generalization of varying degrees of mistreatment and killings of those loosely defined as intellectuals. Here, the idea of wearing glasses becomes a kind of abbreviation, referring to all educated people who were forced to live in Pol Pot's Cambodia. So, whether we can literally say the statement is true or not, is less relevant to the larger reasons why refugees and survivors of the regime came to share this fable, and why it was so commonly associated with the Khmer Rouge treatment of educated Cambodians. But from what direction was this treatment coming? If thousands of intellectuals had been killed, who was deciding this? Was there some kind of central directive from the leadership to kill intellectuals or people wearing glasses? Or was this a case of less senior officials simply picking people because they looked smart? Well, there are three reasons that led to thousands of the intellectual class being killed. Ideology, vengeance, and paranoia. The ideology of the Communist Party of Kampuchea was heavily influenced by Maoism. This is plain to see in the slogans that were commonly used by Khmer Rouge cadre. The French historian Henri Locard compiled many of these. For instance, with the Ankar, we shall make a great leap forward, a prodigious great leap forward. Or, the spade is your pen, the rice field your paper. And, if you have a revolutionary consciousness, you can do anything, comrade. The Cambodian Revolution borrowed both materially and ideologically from the Chinese, whose own communist revolution had favoured the rural peasantry and farmers. In the words of Locard, this was the revenge of the ignorant over the educated, 
The meritocracy of our own world turned on its head. The fewer degrees you had, the more power you attained. After April 1975, once the CPK had taken control of the entirety of Cambodia, they instigated their total revolution, and in essence created a new society. One with a social hierarchy that placed those closer to an idealised revolutionary on the top, and those furthest away from attaining this revolutionary consciousness on the bottom. Meaning that the poor rural peasants were favoured, and the former city-dwelling classes were viewed with suspicion and ire. The idea of vengeance is also closely related to the ideological imperative to favour the rural classes over the urban, or favour the old or base people over these new arrivals, the new people, or 17th of April people, as they became known. Not only were those evacuated from the cities tainted by their so-called capitalist and imperialist background, and therefore less capable of following the party line, but they were also generally associated with the losing side of the country's long and bloody civil war. There was sometimes a punitive element to their treatment in the countryside. This is exemplified by slogans such as, Those who have never laboured but slept comfortably, they must be made to produce fruit. Or, Comrade, you have been used to a comfortable and easy life. Those from a rural background that had joined the revolution were taught that their struggle was pure and correct, while those who lived in the city and hadn't joined them were nasty and bad. The poor peasants often regarded the rich and the educated as essentially the same, and having glasses was a mark of education, because both the rich and educated looked down on them they were considered enemies. The CPK valued the collective over the individual, and their movement was about creating a society of ideal revolutionaries. The further you strayed from that idealised collective, whether through a minor transgression or your ethnicity, religion, background, education, or yes, even sometimes for something as arbitrary as wearing glasses. This could be considered as being counter-revolutionary, and warrant your execution. But why were they executed, rather than simply mistreated? Well, that brings us to the paranoia of the regime itself. There is something called the 30th of March 1976 Directive, which was a decision made at a meeting of the CPK central leadership. This is when they officially delegated the power to kill individuals who were suspected of counter-revolutionary activity. This power was transcutions from the state. Some unknown number, probably in the hundreds of thousands, would have been killed for their class background. Some percentage of that number may have been identified solely on the basis of their wearing glasses. It's impossible to know. What we do know is that there was no central directive that went out from the party leadership that said, round up and kill everyone with glasses, or smash those who are educated and have glasses. But this does not absolve the leadership of guilt for the crimes that were committed from top to bottom. The central leadership, as well as having disseminated the ideological program that the movement was adhering to, was also highly informed. There were constant reports being compiled and sent back up the chain detailing what was happening in the villages and zones. The leadership would have been fully aware of these enemies being swept clean, and not only did they not issue any kind of reprieve, no statement saying, don't kill intellectuals, or 
don't kill people for not being able to work. Instead, they ramped up the rhetoric about potential enemies and which classes were more or less capable revolutionaries. In fact, a senior leader such as Nguyen Chao may have even had prior experience seeing poor peasants mistreating people on the basis of them wearing glasses. Philip Short, author of Pol Pot, The History of a Nightmare, raised this point when testifying at the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. He said that the Khmer Isarak, an anti-colonial movement that was active in Cambodia in the 40s, were also guilty of harassing and killing people for wearing glasses. This was a similar association of intellectuals to the corrupt society that the Isarak were trying to overturn. And again, this movement was drawn from an impoverished rural population base. Nguyen Chao was a member of this older movement too, and Short suggests that he would have been able to guess that the Khmer Rouge Revolution would have fostered similar behaviour. This highlights the fundamental failure of the democratic Kampuchea regime to protect its citizens. A failure they managed in every sphere of life. A failure to protect that was coupled with an abhorrent, active sponsoring of other mass killings. So with all of that in mind, can we really conclude that the Khmer Rouge killed everyone with glasses? Well, yes and no. It is worth mentioning that different zones and administrative areas of democratic Kampuchea were run by different party officials. Some were more zealous than others. Even though power was highly centralised, it must be said that there was no established rule throughout the whole country. What could get you killed in one area might have been ignored in another. Survivor of the period and former engineer Pinya Thai states that Discipline varied at the whim of each village chief. There were good villages in the worst regions and bad villages in the best. This idea of the regional variations in democratic Kampuchea is something that we may return to in a later essay, but for now it is worth remembering when trying to answer such a generalised question about the period. I mean, it's a rather trivial point, but you could answer this statement by pointing to the fact that some of the central party leadership also wore glasses, like Son Sen, and he oversaw the running of S21. I mean, in a way, it does kind of depend on how you turn the phrase itself. Saying something along the lines of, you could have been killed if you were wearing glasses, is a lot closer to reality than the Khmer Rouge killed everyone with glasses as a matter of policy. But regardless of the literal truth of the statement, its common usage allowed refugees and then survivors of the regime to articulate complex and horrifying scenarios that took place in the country in an impactful and succinct way. It tells us about Khmer Rouge ideology paranoia, and the kind of social hierarchy that was in place, as well as the utter disregard for human life that the movement has become synonymous with. Which is perhaps why the saying itself has endured so long. Thank you for watching. Uh, this series is a kind of an offshoot of the in-depth podcast that I produce about Cambodian history called In the Shadows of Utopia. So do look for that wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you have a question you think would make a good video for this series, don't hesitate to leave it in the comments below. Thanks again. Bye-bye.